cringe with anger. And yet, many of these things are easily remedied if there is the will. A further example of the difficulties in our criminal justice system is some of the procedures in courts themselves. Certainly, in the last 10 years, 15 years, there have been some advances in some of the rules of evidence. Rules of evidence relating to taking the evidence of people with disabilities. Again, whether it be victims, alleged perpetrators, there have been certainly some advancements. But there remains much to be done. I think it was in 1991 that some ratbag by the name of Kevin Cox <laughs> decided to take on the state of Queensland relating to the lack of proper access to the then multi-million dollar convention centre. A convention centre about which we are all today very proud and it is used very, very often. A tremendous asset for the community in general. But in 1991, it took somebody with the foresight and the fortitude that Kevin Cox has to institute proceedings to demand that that magnificent building be accessible to all. Because that building was to have a grand entrance at the front, approximately 30 stairs, but much use for people like Kevin. What did Kevin have to do? And other people with disabilities, not only people who are reliant upon wheelchairs for certain <coughs> movement, but also elderly people, parents with children. I had to go around the corner and use the goods lift. I know that there was nothing unusual about that, in particular at that time. They were used to it. But fortunately, there are people like Kevin who won't stand for that with the result that, ultimately, a lift was erected at the front of the building so that people with mobility restrictions were able to use the front entrance like everyone else. Many people outside this room might think, so what? What is wrong with just going around the corner a bit? What is wrong with that? Why should the cost be increased merely for a small percentage of people? Well, of course, the answer is very simple. Not only is there the practical issues involved, such as why should not people with such mobility disabilities be able to use the entrance for grand occasions like everyone else? But in addition to that, there is what it says to society if we don't have such access. What does it say to society? It says to society that we put up with people being treated differently. That in itself is bad enough. But what is really the worst aspect of that sort of attitude, as far as I'm concerned, is the impact it has on our young. That our young grow up thinking that this sort of thing is acceptable. That is why publications such as this is so, so important. Not only because it agitates for change, but it is part of education generally. I spoke about Kevin's case because at the time of his case, things happened like uh, Kevin is sitting there along with three or four other people in wheelchairs and the court orderly comes in, the judge comes in and says, all stand, this tribunal is now in session. 
Now, when that was pointed out, how ridiculous that was, immediate changes were made. It only happened on the one occasion in that case. But it still is, that phrase is still often used. Again, some would say not a major thing, but for the reasons I outlined earlier, I suggest it is of more significance than most people acknowledge. Other difficulties, of course, was access to the buildings. Again, that has improved, but not necessarily access within the courts themselves. There are many witness boxes <coughs> that cannot accommodate a person who is using a wheelchair. Those sort of things still remain, so we have a long way to go. If one spends any time out of our prisons and gets talking to prisoners, one is readily struck by the number or the percentage of people in our prisons who, I would suggest, have obvious difficulties. And yet, they, many of them are there because our justice system, and in particular our criminal justice system, still does not adequately provide the necessary services, both as part of general living, so that the people aren't desperate, as Kevin referred to. Many people commit crimes because they are desperate. They just want to eat. They just want to have basic necessities. But in addition to that, um, these people, when they are in the criminal justice system, often are not able to adequately tell their story. They are not provided the facilities to adequately explain what it is that motivated them at the time or what it is that they actually did. And this is even worse when, with juries, little training, if any, is provided to jurors as to how to deal with the evidence of a person who might communicate in a way so-called different from the rest of us. It's a bit like with Indigenous people. Many Indigenous people, particularly those in the more remote areas of the state, have little, difficult, uh, have little contact with the capital city and have much less contact with the broader community than is otherwise the case throughout Queensland. And they have cultural ways of communicating. Let me use the example of many will not look you in the eye because they consider that rude. And yet, Many jurors think it is a sign of guilt. These are not minor things, these matters of communication, because they go to the root of our justice system, and in particular, our criminal justice system. How can one possibly have a fair criminal justice system if there are these sort of inequities? Turning to the report, let me deal with a case that was before the Court of Appeal last week, namely the matter of Lyons and the State of Queensland. I see that in 2007, Philip French had a big involvement in your earlier report. Well, Philip's still at it. Philip last week instructed me in an appeal in our Court of Appeal, which is the highest court in our state, the only higher court in the country is to the High Court, in this matter of lines in the state of Queensland. 
What was it about? Ms. Lyons, let me call her again. She's quite proud of what she has achieved to date. She is a lady with hearing impairment and she requires the services of an Auslan interpreter to properly communicate. She received a letter from the bailiff advising that she had been randomly selected for jury duty. And she was required to communicate with the court, which she did, but she also advised that she had this hearing difficulty. Well, that was where her difficulties began. Because ultimately, she was told that she was not eligible to be called up or to actually be selected to serve in a jury because of her hearing impairment. In this day and age. Why? Well, two main reasons. The, the Jury Act provides that the only persons allowed to communicate with members of the jury are the bailiffs. Therefore, it would not be possible to have an Auslan interpreter in the jury room because that was what has been euphemistic, euphemistically referred to as the 13th person. You can't have that. What does the Jury Act provide? I'm not going to bore you with law, but this is important because what I suggest is this. What the Jury Act says is what should occur. But it doesn't say what cannot occur. Let me put it another way. We should approach these problems with what your gay lions of this world can do rather than what they cannot do. If her case had been approached in that way, there would have been no problem. The Act provides that a person who is enrolled as an elector related to, to gay, namely a person who has a physical or mental disability that makes the person incapable of effectively performing the functions of a jury. Now, let me repeat that. A person who has a physical or mental disability that makes the person incapable of effectively performing the functions of a jury. Well, there was nothing that made her incapable of effectively performing the functions of a juror. That was accepted. All she needed was an Auslan interpreter. Terribly inconvenient, isn't it? Imagine having to communicate in a jury room with an Auslan interpreter. Clearly, that cannot be a problem. That cannot mean that she was incapable of effectively performing the functions of a juror. So, the state argued, oh, look, there's also section 54 of the Act, which says, and I quote, this is the last quote I'll have from the Act, while a jury is kept together, a person must not communicate with any of the jurors without the judge's leave. There are two things about that. Firstly, I would argue it would be a simple thing to merely seek the leave of the judge for the Auslan interpreter to be in the jury room. Very, very simple. And I suspect most judges would agree readily that everything else being equal, that such a person should be allowed in the jury room with the Austrian interpreter. That is, the judge would readily give leave, I would suggest. When I say everything else being equal, that is, so long as the person went through the normal procedures as everyone else, that is, being able to be challenged by the defence and similarly by the prosecution for whatever mysterious reasons there are for people being rejected, remembering that all that is ever provided 
to the defence is the name, occupation and address. So often we think, ah, oh, they come from Hamilton, they come from Ascot. Ooh, no, 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 maybe not, maybe they're too posh and therefore wouldn't be too good. Or if it's a sex offence, then there are certain members of the community we wouldn't want, or age. And really, that's all we get to go on. So, how would a person with a hearing impairment be any different from anyone else? Clearly not. One of the reasons the court, the um, state argued that she was unable to perform the duties of a juror was of a decision handed down by a single justice of the Supreme Court on the 14th of May of last year. The background to that was that, again, an individual had been selected on a jury panel to perform jury service. She advised the sheriff that she required an Auslan interpreter in the event that she was impaneled. The sheriff referred the question to the court for determination as to whether or not that person was eligible for the jury service. Why was that question referred to the court? For no other reason than the person had a hearing impairment and required an Auslan interpreter. Or let me put it another way. It was not suggested that she was incapable of performing the duties of a juror, because clearly she was. So there wasn't that prohibition in the Act, a prohibition in the Act that I acknowledge in certain circumstances would be fair to impose. Because some people <coughs> would perhaps be incapable of performing the duties of a juror, may not, for instance, uh, be able to devote three or four weeks of their time, let alone months. It could be any number of reasons. So I've got no problem with the existence of that provision. But my problem is the existence of a provision like that automatically being used to prevent a person from sitting as a juror. That individual told the sheriff that she was able to lip read well, but that because her hearing was not good, she may miss parts of some conversations, and therefore would like an Auslan interpreter. His Honour heard from no lawyers, in other words, it was a matter that wasn't argued, by the lawyers, but rather the sheriff just sent it to his honour and said, look, what am I to do? But we had, we had a decision by his honour, even though it wasn't argued by the parties. And his honour said two things that uh, we argued in the Court of Appeal could not be right. That one of the reasons that she couldn't serve was that the difficulties arise in respect of deliberation by the jury in the jury room during and after the hearing of evidence. And he referred to that section 54 that I referred to. That is, a person cannot communicate with any of the jurors while they are deliberating. Um, unfortunately, his honour didn't deal with the particular phrase in that same provision without the judge's leave because I find it difficult to understand why a judge couldn't give leave in these sort of circumstances. And his honour said, while section 54, which is that provision I was just speaking to, speaking about, prohibits a person communicating with any of the jurors without the judge's leave, it is not at all clear that the judge's ability to give leave would permit the presence of an interpreter in the jury room during the jurors' deliberations. That's as far as he was prepared to go. And this is my point, but it may not have said that, but there was no prohibition there. So it comes back to why don't we address these problems as to what people cannot do rather than, sorry, from the point of view of what these people can do rather than cannot do. Or um, if 
as in this particular jury act, there is no explicit power, explicit power preventing interpreters being present. Why don't we then say, well, of course, if necessary, interpreters can be present? I, for the life of me, cannot see any reason why we can't approach it in that way. Um, now, it'll be interesting to see what the Court of Appeal says. That was heard <coughs> yesterday. But it's an example of the sort of difficulties that people with disabilities still encounter on a daily basis in our criminal justice system. The Turning to the report, I note that the core argument throughout the report is that over-representation of people with disabilities in the criminal justice system is indefensible and warrants urgent remedial action. And the Queensland Government must continually refine and reform the system to reduce it. Rather uncontroversial, I would suggest. There is no doubt that people with disabilities are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. No doubt about that. All the figures show that. And for the reasons summarised by Martin Luther King and referred to by Kevin, such behaviour is indefensible. So what flies from that, it warrants urgent remedial action. It means that the Queensland Government must continually refine and reform the system to reduce it. Rather uncontroversial sentiments. And I suspect most politicians would agree with that, let alone all fair-minded fair people in the community. But the problem often comes to will. Is there the will on the part of our politicians? That often is where the problem arises, I suggest. However, politicians like to be re-elected. Therefore, reports such as this are very important in education in the community generally so that politicians can be lobbied, so that politicians can understand that yes, there are votes in doing the right thing in these types of areas. <coughs> yes, perhaps I should do what I am paid to do, and that is be a leader. I have this view that today our politicians aren't the leaders that they were even 20 or 30 years ago. That one of the worst things that have happened to our political system are opinion polls. Because they're always looking at opinion polls. That's why I was pleased to see how in Britain a couple of weeks ago they got it so wrong. Not because of the result necessarily, but rather Hopefully, these opinion polls would no longer have the status of being God. Because opinion polls are quite expensive. With the result that people, for example, with disabilities, don't have the resources to use opinion polls the way other people are able to use them. They often are used to educate, or no, perhaps the better way of putting it is to mould public opinion because of the way questions are phrased. So the core, the core argument of this report, extremely uncontroversial but rather simple, insofar as its content, but difficult in its implementation. 
key recommendations. Develop a disability justice strategy consistent with Australia's obligation as a state party to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. People with Disabilities, Parliament, the Department of Justice and Attorney General, the Queensland Police Service, the Judiciary, Corrective Services, Legal Aid, Community Legal Services and other stakeholders to develop the strategy, the strategy outlined in the report. The strategy should enunciate a core set of principles and actions that will guide appropriate communication, early intervention, diversion, training, accountability and monitoring, and then will address anachronistic language in the criminal code. Let me just deal with that last one. Anachronistic language in the criminal code. For example, unsoundness of mind. What does, that, what does that convey? It conveys more than is the reality. So even small things like the use of language can make a huge, huge difference. And attractive to politicians, costly, if any, in merely altering language. The use of language is so powerful albeit subconsciously. The strategy should enunciate a core set of principles and actions that will guide appropriate communication, early intervention, diversion, training, accountability and monitoring. Communication, well that's obvious. Early intervention, diversion, training, accountability and monitoring. They're all so simple, to write at least. Again, to most if not all people in the room today, they would say all of that is mere common sense. All of, all of that should not really be an issue. All of that contains the type of procedures that I would like my daughter, my uncle, my brother to be treated if they had a disability. And that's the sort of argument that can appear to people in the community. What if your loved one was a person with a disability? Would you put up with them being treated in this way? And so often the answer would be, of course not. And that is why this report is so useful in addressing some of these issues, how some of these issues can be overcome, and as I've spoken about earlier, the communication. Now, Will French's work was published in 2007 the year after the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability was ratified by the United Nations. That convention highlighted the need for a stronger emphasis on the interface between disabilities and the law and justice. If I could just sidetrack for a moment. Law and justice. Many people think <coughs> the same thing. It's certainly not. We have law, but often we do not have justice for the reasons as touched upon in the report. Often there is no justice within the law. And I say that as somebody who has been practicing in the law for some 30 years. I readily acknowledge that sometimes, and perhaps more than a mere sometimes, the law is operating, but justice isn't. And perhaps in no greater area than 
in the area of people with disabilities. Ten or fifteen years ago, one may have had to say in the area of disabilities and or relating to our Indigenous people. Well, I think as a community, we have addressed more of the issues relating to, people, to Indigenous people than we have with people with disabilities. Don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that even with our Indigenous people that they get justice <coughs> at all times, far from it. However, um, I think society has been educated to a much greater extent about the importance of providing justice to our Indigenous people than has been the case with people with disabilities. I spoke of the Convention, ratified, sorry, again, adopted in 2006, Australia ratified. So, what Australia did in ratifying it was accepted that people with disabilities should have effective access to justice. Effective access to justice. I'd venture to suggest for the reasons, or at least for some of the reasons outlined in the report, because I suspect there are even other reasons that aren't in the report, um, access to justice is not available at all times to people with disabilities. Equal justice has not yet been achieved. Let me just refer to a few parts of the report, page 151. The, crime, the state's crime rates have been dropping for two decades. In 2015, there is less crime and fewer victims of crime per capita than in the 1990s. Yet there is no evidence that the proportion of people with disabilities defending criminal matters has <coughs> diminished. And this is despite the Queensland Government having spent increased finances in law enforcement and the imprisonment of people who commit crimes. We have more police and prisons including a state-of-the-art forensic disability facility at Wacom. But we have little to demonstrate positive, qualitative change in enforcement and administration of criminal justice. The Australian Institute of Criminology data shows that in 42% of Australian fatal police shootings, the person shot was mentally ill. In 2014, there were six shooting victims in Queensland. At least two of those had intellectual impairments. And I heard in the news this morning that there is to be an inquest into five such deaths at the hand of the police in Queensland later this year. I would imagine that QAI would be wanting to get involved in that particular inquest. So it's quite clear that there is a long, long way to go. Also in the report, there is the reference to the over-representation of people with disabilities as suspects offenders and as victims of crime being one of the most striking features of our criminal justice system. The principal causes of overrepresentation lie outside the system and are linked to lifelong exclusion, unemployment, poverty, limited communication, the community participation and to the race and gender of people with disabilities. Clearly, there is an urgent need for reform in our criminal justice system.
2007 report, if I could use that loose phraseology, offered broad analysis and critique. This report has moved on somewhat and focuses on micro reforms at different stages of the criminal justice process. The fact that QAI feels that it is useful to move on and start dealing with some of these micro reforms in itself shows that perhaps slow progress is being made. But there is no doubt we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go in the provision of services in the whole spectrum of our criminal justice system. With the Queensland Police Service, diversion, the forensic system, the court processes, the correction system, and assistance in the post-corrections environment. It is only when we are able to achieve change in all of those areas will we be reaching the stage where people with disabilities are able to at least consider that they are being close to being treated as equals in our community. Often people say, well, why do we need to treat certain minority groups in our community differently from everyone else? And perhaps that sort of thought is illustrated by our justice system often being depicted as a woman holding a sword and a set of scales and wearing a blindfold. That image is taken as a representation of the idea of equality before the law, which in its formal sense is blind to difference, including attributes such as disability. Quality before the law is certainly not a guarantee of equal justice. A law of general application may have adverse discriminatory outcomes because of the different circumstances of those to whom it applies. The different circumstances and attributes to those to whom it applies. For example, Section 54 of the Jury Act says no one is to be in the jury room except the jurors. Well, that law applies to all, but clearly it's discriminatory, I would suggest, because it doesn't take into account the different circumstances and attributes of people who don't fit the social mould. <coughs> the, the, the type of law that uh, treats everyone as equals in the law is summed up by a comment made in 1894 by a head of France, which is as follows. I, I love this quote because I think it typifies the issues that we're dealing with. The law, in its majestic equality, forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets and to steal bread. Of course it does. It applies to all. But, obviously, it has a greater impact on certain people and will have absolutely no impact on the majority of people, and unfortunately, it will certainly have no impact on the majority, if not all, of the politicians. <laughs>
clearly lies one of the difficulties we face, I suspect, in getting change. I'm aware of the time. Let me just deal with some of the comments made by the High Court in recent years. In the context of a law may have a degree of flexibility and build in a discretion in the way in which it is applied to individuals. The exercise of the discretion may take into account differences between people which are relevant to the scope and purpose of the law. And the example the High Court has recently cited is in the area of sentencing discretion. Here, quality before the law can be consistent with the concept of equal justice. The Court has said, equal justice requires identity of outcome in cases that are relevantly identical. It requires different outcomes in cases that are different in some respect. And the court highlighted the words relevantly and different. Let me read it again. Equal justice requires identity of outcome in cases that are relevantly identical. It requires different outcomes in cases that are different in some relevant respect. That was in 2001. Ten years later, the court put it this way. Equal justice embodies the norm expressed in the term equality before the law. It is an aspect of the rule of law. It applies to the interpretation of statutes and thereby to the exercise of statutory powers. It requires, so far as the law permits, that like cases be treated alike. Equal justice according to law also requires, where the law permits, differential treatment of persons according to differences between them relevant to the scope, purpose and subject matter of the law. Those two quotes of our, the highest court in our land are applicable to the issue that we are discussing here today. Equal justice requires differential treatment of persons according to differences between them relevant to the scope, purpose and subject matter of the law. Consequently, I would suggest that there really can be no controversy that the idea of so-called equal justice may be seen as a more demanding standard than that of formal equality before the law. And it is in that regard that reports such as this are just so, so important. I congratulate all of those who contributed to it and it is my pleasure indeed to now launch the report. Thank you very much.